In four months, Ghana goes to the polls. To many, this is a crucial election. A crucial election because representatives of the governing New Patriotic Party, including the president, Nana Adedankwa Kofuado, have made it clear to Ghanaians that they will do everything to ensure they win this year's general election. The opposition NDC, which has been in, in, in opposition for the past eight years, has also responded with representatives, including the former president, who is a flag bearer of the NDC, John Mahama, also saying that the NDC will ensure that this election is not stolen. And this time, the NDC is not going to court. What do these comments from these influential individuals mean? And these are people whose words can make or unmake the country ahead or during or before and after the country's general election. My name is Beatrice Edu. We are privileged and honored to have the Right Honorable Speaker of Ghana's Parliament, Alban Sumana Kingsford Bagwin. He's going to tell us really these comments that have come up, what could be done from his office and really all of us to ensure that there is peaceful environment and also the elections are peaceful, even in the midst of challenges like the economy, security. Now we are talking about Galamse, who could be a potential threat as we head into this very crucial election. Thank you very much for joining us and good afternoon to you, Right Honourable Speaker of Parliament. And thank you so much for opening your offices for us today. Good afternoon and you are welcome. It's not my office, it's also your office. This is the office of the Speaker of Parliament, inherited from the Governor General of the Gold Coast. This used to be the office of the Governor General of the Gold Coast. A number of influential people indeed occupying this office even before you came in. Oh yes, I'm just a, a son of them. So uh, I was so privileged and honored to be given that position by the good people of Ghana, uh, even though I was nominated by my party, it was my members of parliament, <coughs> the members of parliament from the National Democratic Congress, who mostly voted for me, even though I benefited a few votes from the new patriotic party. <laughs> Indeed. <coughs> to win over my professor, who used to take us on a number of workshops as member of parliament. So I am forever indebted to my party and members of parliament and this country for this opportunity to serve them for these four years. Mm. Let me first ask you, I just said that the country has <coughs> about four months to go into uh, this major election, 2024 general election. And I, I was saying that the opposition NDC wants to come back to power after eight years in being opposition. The governing party, and we've heard the president say that a number of times, that I'm handing over power to Baomia, who is currently the vice president of the country and the, running, uh, the flag bearer of the MPP. Are you comfortable with the current political climate we have now? Well, let me start by thanking TV3 for this opportunity. Well, if you recall not long ago, I made a formal statement on the floor of parliament indicating that I was not at ease with the political environment and the happenings and the loud silence of stakeholders in the country uh, concerning the process of uh, the Electoral Commission and the political parties, the main actors in elections. And therefore, it wasn't giving us some good omen that the critical 2024 elections could come out credibly and peacefully. And so I made a statement to the extent that I was going to lead the institution of parliament to reach out to the stakeholders. And I did mention some of the stakeholders, particularly His Excellency the President. I mentioned the Chief Justice, 
the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, uh, the National Commission on Civic Education, the Inspector General of Police, the Chief of Defense Staff, and the political parties. That it was important that these important stakeholders came together to work towards what are called building trust for a free, fair, credible, and peaceful election. And I didn't leave it there. I actually moved to try and to include the public. And that is how come we initiated the idea of Democracy Cup, trying to build a culture of democracy using sports. Everybody matters in this journey. And it's important that we do that together. That is why you saw me in the office of the president presenting to the president the Democracy Cup and sharing with him my intent and in fact vision of how we could go about working together to build trust in the process, particularly in the institutions of government, especially the Electoral Commission. And we'll go into the Electoral Commission as well. But I want to pick on what you said just a, a few minutes ago, which is the loud silence of state in institutions. Are you saying that prior to this initiative that you're championing, these institutions like the NCC, the Peace Council, among others, were failing us woefully? There were some attempts made by them. Um, I recall the National Peace Council inviting some people they identified as stakeholders. I myself received a letter uh, calling on us to come for some lectures and discussions on this topic. But it was not properly organized because these were not done in consultation with the stakeholders. I just mentioned to you that after my statement on the floor, I actually moved Indeed. to the stakeholders and they discussed with them. I got the president to agree and in fact did indicate that he will personally be at the Accra Sports Stadium. I got the chairperson to agree and to be there herself and she did honor it. I got the chief justice to agree and to be there herself and she did honor it. The same for the IGP and the commanders and the CDS. Then the public and I decided to use the ex-players of the Ghana Black Stars, led by Stephen Appiah, Tonado himself. And they were there in their numbers. And so it was not just sitting and writing to them, but we actually followed up. And together, we agreed on the date. Unfortunately, His Excellency the President could not make it, but the Minister for Youth and Sports represented him. And we had a very good show. And so, after that one, I continued the process and decided that the speaker's seminar lectures, which I initiated in 2021, the second one was going to take place in Tamale. I organized it and I got key members of these stakeholders to lead the presentation. And so the chairperson was invited she agreed to the date. There was some uh, challenge, and the date had to be changed. She couldn't make it herself, but the deputy chairperson was there to represent her. We also had Professor Emmanuel Kwesi Enning, as you know, uh, a consultant, and also the one in charge of the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Center, as the key note speaker and he did a very good job. I invited civil society, Imani represented civil society, and uh, lawyer Kofi Bentel came to deliver their position paper on this matter. We invited the public, the chiefs, the people, students, and the whole hall was full. The political parties were invited, and so led by the regional minister and the chairpersons of the political parties, we had a very good interaction 
on this same topic. So I, I, I was asking, I, I picked on that loud silence bit because I'm sure you're aware that about a month ago, the chairman of the NDC said that the party felt that Peace Council in particular was not doing anything about what was happening and therefore it didn't find the, the party didn't find the need to sign any peace pact. It was after that that we saw a lot of press conferences, not just from the Peace Council but also from the Electoral Commission who we'll go into the abit and the BVDs and how they are even handling all of that. Would you say that the Peace Council had been sleeping until uh, Johnson Asiedun Ketia stood on his ground and said that you people are not being fair to us? Well, you recall that the statements you referred to did not just happen this year. These statements were made a few years back, particularly His Excellency the President's statement that he will not hand over power to John Dramani Mahama. He will hand over power to the flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party. That was made far back as a uh, early 2023. And he's kept yes, making and that he comment. kept making it. And it was supported, you know, loudly by a cabinet minister, Honorable Brian Achampong. And nothing happened. And we had similar statements being made by party apparatchiks. Nothing happened until recently that the Peace Council came in. And the Peace Council came in also through the back door. He didn't do it properly. So is he Adin Katia so was right? 100%. He I was 100% and that has now ignited this flood of concern by many. And so you see, apart from me coming out to say that no, something must be done, the Peace Council then initiated some efforts and their attention was drawn to the fact that since the 2020 elections. Since the Ayawasu by elections, a number of things happened. Commissions were established, reports were presented, recommendations were made. There were some statements that they will be implemented, and nothing has happened. So now we are moving to another. This time, the 2024 elections is unlike the 1992 elections or the 1996 or the 2000 elections. Why do you say that? It's not also like the 2004, 2008, or 2012 elections. Why? Neither is it like the 2016 and 2020. This is a critical election that will determine whether we are truly committed to the cause of multi-party constitutional democracy. Clearly, this election is not just yes, about the political parties. It's about the soul of our nation. Very, very important. And so to have very experienced political leaders, particularly His Excellency the President, who started politics at a very early age because of his parenthood, and who was what an activist in the CPP party, grew up to be the president of Kwame Nkrumah Youth Forum, and after the 66 election, joined the United Party, Progress Party, now MPP, to come out after all that experience, a legal luminary, to say such a thing. That is inciting people to violence. Okay. That even if we lost the election, we will not hand over. We will do all we can to hold on to power. That is unacceptable. I was really shocked to hear that because His Excellency the President knows that the power he's holding is not his. It's for the people, particularly the voters. And the people voted and gave him that power. Once they vote you out, they, he even is ending mm -hmm. his eight years period. At the 6th of January, 2025, His Excellency Nana Adodanko Akufuado has no such power. 
He knows that if he orders the CDS on the 7th of January 1990 to do anything, he will not do it. My understanding of what you're saying, really... He has no such power, so it's just an empty boast. Brutum fulmin. He cannot. He will not have that power. It's the person that the people have now voted for that have been given the power. And though the people are looking at that person, not him. So either His, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama or His Excellency Dr. Uh, uh, Mahmoud Baumia. You do not think so that those that are the people that will have power, and those are the people that Ghanaians will now be listening to, not to him. So he has nothing, not even an empty shell. What we do is just a ceremony to show that power has now shifted from the former to the newly elected person. You do not think that those comments were deep expressions of, I really wish that Baumia would, would take over the reins of power for me? You just said it. What prevented him from using that same language? If I, oh, it's my wish that MPP should win the elections and Baumia would take over from me. But if you go and say, categorically, I will not hand over power, as if the power is still in your hands. <laughs> but by that time, it's not in his hands. You just gave his history there, where he started from before he even became president. Yeah. Would you say that that comment was irresponsible and he's repeated it? Well, His Excellency knows better. You know, in mature democracies, they will take actions more down what we will do. That would have soiled all his records as a politician. You know, and all those descriptions people make of him in terms of law and the defense of human rights or the media and also his record as a president. This cancels out all. It doesn't show that he's a Democrat and that he believes in multi party democracy. If I hear what you're saying, you were disappointed when you very, heard that. Very, in fact, it was. I was shocked, was at least expected His Excellency to say such a thing. But in addition to that, you just brought to the fore again a statement made by Brian Champon, and he's repeated it. He's a member of parliament, a parliament you oversee. Have you done anything about it? How do you see that, first of all? Brian Achampon is scarcely in parliament. You see, that is another thing that we have to do. You see, political leadership is a different ball game. You just don't trust untried and untested hands straight from birth into leadership position. How do you they mean? have to be groomed. They have to be tutored. They have to be mentored. They have to grow to it. They must have hands-on experience. And so the system we are running is a system that is damaging the growth of this country. Brian doesn't where have the people, experience. Where? In politics? Zero. He just elected as a member of parliament and has made a cabinet minister. He has no knowledge about the public sector, about governance, about politics, and he is now going to lead the whole sector. He has never handled such power before, and therefore, they think that they are the alpha and the omega. So you think that's what's that is, influencing that how what, he's behaving? Not only him, a number, a number of our people in politics now. You know, as they grow, they will learn that what they did were wrong. M mean. And they were really undermining their own authority and relevance. Won't it be too late? Very late. And that's one of the cause of our underdevelopment. Many countries, many, many countries who have made it have taken the time to evolve. And the evolution is not only about systems, it's also about human beings. And so we just don't take those decisions lightly. That you're given the opportunity to lead the country. If you want to bring up definitely his growth, his replacement, 
we must always go with the youth, we must go with everybody, but you give them the position to grow. Okay? Once we keep on just cutting, cutting corners and doing what is happening now, we can never develop as a nation. We can never develop as a nation, you say. Uh, we are talking about inflammatory comments and languages or language ahead of this year's general election. And I know uh, that you also heard the bit said by the former president, John Mahama, who is leading the opposition NDC. When he said, and he said it a number of times as well, that we will make sure that this election is not stolen and this time we are not going to court. How did you understand this comment? The first part deals with vigilance and ensuring that the right thing is done. That this time around, what happened in 2020, where brute force was used at some stations to take away the decision of the people, we will not allow that to happen again. Mm. Which meant that there's a loss of trust in the process and in the Electoral Commission. And so if the Electoral Commission is not going to take up the mantle together with the other stakeholders, particularly the security agencies led by the Ghana Police Service. And note, it is not Ghana Police Force. It is Ghana Police Service. And they are to deal with the maintenance of law and order. And you don't just maintain law and order by force. No, that is not it. But unfortunately, that is where we are. And they are the key institution to maintain law and order. The military has no business when we are doing elections to be present until law and order breaks down and they are called in. So you want them to stay off? Completely. I have stated it a number of times that we would not want to see our military moving around. They have to be at positions that could be, they could be called to intervene when they need arises. But already you know that the military have been deployed. I mean, officials have been deployed to border towns to enforce even this ban on uh, exportation of the country's grains because of the drought in seven regions of the country. And that is catastrophic and a complete exaggeration of the situation. Just to create a platform to go in for a facility. And who knows how that facility will be applied. That is my honest view. What do you mean by facility? A credit facility in terms of money or in terms of food items, is that kind of thing? The NDC thinks it's an attempt to intimidate voters around that place. You see, you, you, people really don't understand the situation we are in. The Ghanaian voter can no longer be intimidated. We saw what happened in Kenya. We saw what happened in Nigeria. Ghana is not immune to it. I was a young man in Legon during the regime of President General Akeya Champon. And that was the time they brought in the Muwaks to support the police. They were blue in color. We faced the Muwaks with our bodies, not even with sticks, empty hands. Some of us were killed, but we fought and managed to turn this country to democratic Ghana. The people are not afraid of the military. How many are they in this country? How many are the people? How many bullets do they have? How many were they killed? How many of them will survive? We've seen it before from country to country. So if there's any intention of using the military to threaten and intimidate the voter, they better think twice. Have you spoken to the president or the defense minister about this? I've drawn the attention of the Minister of Defense to some of these things earlier on. In fact, there were a number of times I made requests to lead a, a nonpartisan national team of senior citizens, just because of my position as speaker, to Boko, to try to intervene, to try and find solution to the problem there. And I've been the Minister of Defense the Minister of Interior, the National Security Minister, a number of times just to give me that opportunity. Well, I cannot go there without 
there are no objections. And I would have set up a team of stakeholders to go there, visit, and try to mediate. These overtures were denied. Are there politicians been, flaming have, this uh, conflict in Boko? Because it doesn't seem to go away. Well, if you know the history, it has to do with chieftaincy. In fact, it had to do with rulership. Rulership. Who is in charge? That basically is part of politics. Okay? It's part of governance. And so you need people with that experience to be part and parcel of the mediation process. And I thought our intervention could have made a difference. I held a meeting with the members of parliament. They endorsed it. I held a meeting with some of the senior citizens from the area in Accra here. They endorsed it. And they all wanted to see me there. I had to call the Ghana Police Service to inform them. They were very happy about it. But the minister said no. Why? They gave some reasons that statements we could make there could inflame the situation. And you disagreed with that? I disagreed with them and said we are mature and not, not to make such statements. And definitely, even when Yendi was in flames, at that time I was minority leader. I was the first to be in Yendi. The Yana's palace was on fire when I got to Yendi. But I intervened. And I had to get the permission of the then Minister for Defense. Honorable Dr. Adukufo, and he sent a team to go with me. I had my team, and I intervened to calm down the situation before His Excellency President Kufo could set up the commission. I didn't inflame passions. The parties tried, particularly the New Patriotic Party, to read politics into it, and they came out with some publications. But at the end of the day, they realized that it was a peace mission. And I succeeded. And that's how I got to know that one very well. Because I moved to all the palaces of the paramount chiefs and personally interacted with them, listened to them, and calmed them out. And I met them at meetings, the youth, the women, the chiefs, and all stakeholders. I met the security agencies, the police, the military. It was a military uh, operation Gongo. OK? I met the prison service, the fire service, I interacted with all of them. And I made the displaced women and their children, and in fact, mobilized resources to donate food items to support them. Mm. So we're able to bring down the, the tempest to calm the situation. And you were hoping before. to do the same thing exactly. in Boko and you were denied. I was denied. But I want to stick to this year's election. Why do we seem to have such a polarized climate i mean beyond I, the comments that we're speaking about these are some of the areas that professor emmanuel Enin drew our attention to how critical the 2024 election is to not just the peace and security of ghana but also the future of the country if you look around the sub region ghana is a peace oasis. We are the only country that is still seriously chatting this course of democratic governance without the presence of the visible presence of terrorists. Our northern border, our eastern border, our western border have all these troubles. And further north is west. And so people are just waiting for an opportunity to come in. So there's a really essential and critical need for us to maintain the peace and security of the nation. That's basic. Two, the pressure of the political parties, and you just mentioned the leaders and what they have stated, meant that all is not well. Therefore, the need for some impartial intervention to assure these leaders and the parties that what the Electoral Commission is meant to and committed to doing is to ensure a free, fair, credible, and peaceful election. That 
lost of trust and credibility has to be restored, not by the Electoral Commission, but by stakeholders. The stakeholders are not only politicians or political parties. The public is involved, the media particularly, a very critical partner is the media. The media makes and omics politicians and even countries. Mm. And so media is very critical in this aspect. And we need to go together. And that is why in Tamale, in the night before the lecture, I had to engage the regional media. And we had a very fruitful discussion on that. Their presence was massive and the coverage was excellent. And so we need to go with the media. And more importantly, we need to get the voter. We have to get the voter to understand. One of the things that we've gotten wrong is that the countries that taught us about the franchise, OK? One man, one vote, direct democracy where the people are given the opportunity to elect their leaders, are not practicing it themselves. And so when you go to the United States of America, it's not the voters that elect the president. Electoral college. Electoral college. People, they believe, understand the issues, and have got a lot of stake. And therefore, they look for somebody that is generally seen as capable of leading the whole country. The same in the UK. That is not what is done. And for example, in the UK, there are no constitutional term limits. When the need arises, then there's an election. And the election is not just direct. There is a monarchy that mm. is involved in deciding who should be the prime minister. So within about two years now, we've had how many? About four prime ministers. Yes. Could you have done that in Ghana? No. <laughs> so, it's four years, and you, you, you actually waste a lot of capital, money, that could have been invested in other sectors to grow the economy. And we'll perhaps go into you know? what a number of people are now talking about, which is constitutional democracy, and how perhaps we could, uh, we could implement that in Ghana. I believe that's something that you would have more knowledge to share on with us. And also regarding the stakeholders and how they can help bring trust in our electoral process. We are privileged to have a conversation with Right Honourable uh, Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumana Kingsford Bagwin. We've been talking about a number of issues. Just stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. We are having a conversation with the Right Honourable Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumana Kingsford Bagwin. With about four months to Ghana's general election, a number of issues that are coming up security, electoral commission, and trust. Of course, we'll be going into other issues as well uh, before we wrap up the conversation. Uh, and so just stay with us. Uh, right Honourable Speaker, you were talking about the need for stakeholders to help restore trust in the electoral commission and the processes how do you foresee that or how do you think that could be done working together it cannot be done by any institution or any individual and more importantly to gain back the trust and credibility of the electoral commission and the process cannot be done by the electoral commission it has to be done by all the stakeholders together. And after the lecture in Tamale, the next event will be a round table discussion where we'll bring more of the stakeholders to Georgia, think together, and work together. Don't forget the Electoral Commission, during the course of election, come in with a lot of casual employees. And most of these casual employees are ordinary citizens from various careers or professions that come to support the Electoral Commission. So the Electoral Commission mostly is not in the position to manage these huge numbers. And so it depends on our own value system. It depends on our own commitment to the democratic ideals and particularly 
the patriotic spirit in us to die for Mother Ghana. That determines our conduct and behavior during the elections. Has the EC conducted but itself well ahead of this year's general election? So far, the EC has been prevented from being seen as an impartial arbiter. Prevented by who? You could see the background of some of the employees and the statements that they, they have made. It doesn't place them in the position that this is going to be an unbiased referee. How and that mean? has affected the credibility of the Electoral Commission. Some of the directors have made clear statements about some of the political parties, you know, trying to pitch the commission against those political parties and painting those political parties in such a way that they are the problem in the country and not any other person. That should not come from the mouth of somebody working in the Electoral Commission. But that is what we have now. And all calls to the powers that be, particularly government, to take action because they, those were appointees by government has fallen on deaf ears. So when you say that the And so a party like the National Democratic Congress feels strongly that the Electoral Commission as currently composed is unfavorable to the party. Beyond the directors, when you say that the EC has been prevented, do you mean the appointing body is preventing, as in the government, is yes. preventing the EC from being a fair uh, referee? Exactly that. Exactly that. Apart from that, you have heard, even from civil society, allegations of some untoward things happening at the commission, missing of equipment. And as of today, at the lecture, lawyer Kofi Bentel still stressed that they believed, they believed strongly that what the Electoral Commission put out was incorrect. And that those equipment, plus what they said were uh, disused equipment I had to replace. Originally said where, they were computers and not necessarily connected exactly, to anything. Were actually not the true state of affairs. That is the view they still hold as of today. And so when you come to the parties themselves, there are these concerns they raised. And the Electoral Commission itself has come out to say, talk about lack of logistics and resources to do their work. These are all things that the establishment, the government, could take action to solve. If that is not being taken, then how can you build a trust? And so it's for all of us to coalesce, work together to make sure that the right thing is done before the election day. Or else, we're just playing with fire. Which means what? Well, anything could happen that day. And none of us is praying for that to happen. But if you go to the election and you see that the officials themselves will count up to 20 and the next ballot is 70, then you know you are in trouble. How did you expect the Electoral Commission to handle the BVD issue and also even recently when it actually accepted the fact that it had been wrong with the voter transfers to certain areas, it admitted fault. How did you expect the EC to address this? Yes, I expect them definitely when it's right for them to come out to admit. The chairperson's representative came out loud and clear at the lecture in Tamale, that in some of the cases they've taken action. They have arrested some of the officials. Investigations are going on, and they are likely to prosecute them because the FASI uh, 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 prima facie evidence that some crimes have been committed, and they are likely to take action on that. These are some of the things that the people want to hear, okay? But just to always come out with a blanket denial. When you're dealing with the same human beings that live with us, and it's not the staff of the Electoral Commission, it's not made up of only persons from a political party. There are a lot of the members there who are nonpartisan, 
okay, and committed to the cause of Mother Ghana. You may have a few from other parties there, but the situation that we have, the impression is created that the majority, particularly the leadership, are from people sympathetic to the ruling party. So what I hear you say... And that say, is what we want to try to erode from the minds of the people. What, and we need all stakeholders to come together to be able to do it. What I hear you say, if I'm right, is that beyond the stakeholders coming on board to ensure that we are able to restore trust within the EC, the EC itself, through its leadership, must also prove that it is worthy of the trust Ghanaians want to repose in it. Exactly that. And I was really very happy when I invited the chairperson to discuss this matter with. She was here in my office. We had a lengthy discussion and I shared my views with her, which she accepted and she promised to go by them. But we need to go beyond just discussion in my office, to reach out to the others. And we need to go beyond words into action. People should visibly see steps being taken to build trust in the system and in the institution, the Electoral Commission. So that will be on the part of the Electoral Commission. But Parliament also plays a very crucial role. You're one of the third arms of government. Sure. And earlier, you were talking about some of the things that you're championing yourself, including the Tamale bits, the Accra Sports Stadium bit that you're speaking about. And I think when we spoke before the interview, you even talked about a match that is being worked on in Washington, D.C. Yes. It's part of the processes. That is what it. else do you think you can do to ensure that we're building trust, we're building a wonderful atmosphere, I mean peaceful atmosphere, before, during and after the elections? Definitely, I'm still left with moving to the Council of State. I have a very good relationship with the chairperson of the Council of State. I will, through that connection, engage the Council of State, not me as an individual, but the institution of parliament. Then, we'll get an event with the media because media is very critical in this matter. When we come together, then we organize this round table. This I'm talking about within these few months, mm -hmm. because the election is just in December. Seven. And the, the most opportune period is before the climax of campaigns. And so we don't have much time. And that is what I'm committing myself to do. After the discussions with the uh, Council of State, and definitely these are elders, we we'll have to see how and some of them are our kings and queens. We we'll have to see how we meet them. Okay, the traditional leaders, the spiritual leaders, and particularly the spiritual leaders. When do you intend sometimes, to have this council? Oh, sometimes, please finish sometimes, with that thought. Sometimes, you know, there are some of the things that are beyond us. It's only our creator that could intervene on our behalf. And therefore, we will need them to intervene on our behalf in these matters. And we now have to involve them to understand the situation. And they have much following than the political parties. And they have to reach out to their followers. And so we are trying as much as possible to expedite action in this. The constraints we have is one of funding. It's very serious. Because even Parliament itself, until this week, the third quarter uh, releases for goods and services for Parliament to function was zero. We had nothing. Mm. And our debtors are no longer prepared to extend. They are not being friendly with you friendly, now. Credit, credit, <laughs> credit facilities to us. And so that is a serious uh, a challenge, which I will try as much as possible to surmount. As, as the leader of the institution of parliament. But when do you intend to have that meeting with the Council of Elders? We are having a discussion as to the suitable date because we want attendance to be good. We, we don't impose it on them. We have to get in touch with them to agree. Right. And they are closely mm. just by us here. We are in the same presence. Indeed. So we can always have it. Even if we decide tomorrow and they all agree, we'll meet. Right, Honorable Speaker, going into this year's general election, and that's my final question, you have some expectations of the media because we know what happened in Rwanda. We know or we hear stories about it. What exactly do you think the media should do 
to ensure that after or even before this election, the country is one piece. Join the polls, it is one piece, and will remain at peace after the polls. The media needs no telling, because the media knows the role they have to play. It's just that because of the modern trends and development in the media landscape, it's not very difficult to define who is a media person, because citizens journalists have developed. And so it will be a call to all of us, but more particularly those media practitioners, to do what is right. It's not easy because of lack of logistics, lack of resources, and also capacity. But we should all have clear conscience and focus on doing what is right for the country, not individuals, not parties. And the media should do all it can to hold the balance and be very vigilant to come out with what is right and what is wrong and draw the attention because media shapes minds. And as I said, they make and make people and society. And so the media is very critical. It's an arm of government that we have for some time now, not paid much attention to. And I believe the media is not just for private sector, because all the goods and services you provide are public goods and services. And so the public should have interest, and the public should invest in the media. And so we need to really look at the legal framework that we have in the Constitution and try to strengthen the media to be able to hold all of us including myself, to account. What do you mean the public must strengthen the media? You mean the state or the government must invest in the media? Well, where do the government get their resources from and their mandate? It's from the people. And so when you are able to get the people that educated and carried along, then it's easier for the government to implement that program or policy. That's what I meant by that. Right, Honorable Speaker, your final words. I pray, and not only pray, I work towards making sure that we rebuild the trust and credibility of the electoral process and the electoral commission. And that as Ghanaians who are all loyal to Ghana and patriotic citizens, we really rewind and focus on doing what is right. Ghana is our only dear nation. And we should all do everything possible to make it better for everybody to live in. With this, I want to once again emphasize the importance of the December 2024 elections. It's a critical election that could make or break our journey to the unending path of multi-party democracy. And so it's a plea to all, please, don't just think about today, think about tomorrow. Do your best to make sure that we have before, during, and after the election, a nation called Ghana, our beloved country. If we are able to succeed this time around, we will attract many more people to refocus and to invest in Ghana. So you just watched right there the Right Honourable Speaker of Ghana's Parliament, Alban Sumana Kinsford Bagwin, was the longest, and I should say perhaps has been the longest until his appointment in 2021 as the Speaker of Parliament, uh, was the longest serving Member of Parliament for the Nadoli Kalio constituency for almost three decades. That was about 28 years. And he has not just served that constituency, but understands our parliamentary democracy and also how our politics should be, in addition to multiple awards that he's won.